Alrighty. Good morning, every or good afternoon, everybody. Today we are going to be doing a third session for our Q and A on uh, Q Loras and fine tuning in general. And um, so, if anybody has questions they'd like to have answered, feel free to ask in the comments, and we can start tackling them. Um, we're going to give everybody a little bit of time to come come in. We just started the stream up, and let me go ahead and get to where I should be. There we go. And so today, um, really any question is fine, uh, but I'm mostly prepared for Q-Loras and fine tuning kind of questions. And um, we're gonna be doing a longer session today, about two hours. So whoever has questions, I think we'll be able to tackle most of them. Yesterday we had a lot of great questions and I just wanted to give everybody kind of a chance to get the questions that they like answered, answered and go from there. So, um, Looks like we already have a viewer, so hello, viewer. Um, hey, Hyper Sniper, how are you doing today, sir? And uh, <clears throat> Hyper, do you remember where we left off yesterday? Um, I couldn't remember. Chris, I know where we left off yesterday. Um, and today I brought my writing utensil today, so we can uh, actually hopefully tackle some deeper questions today. Um, if I remember, Chris, we left off yesterday with what, um, how does quantization work specifically during the back prop portion? And um, I kind of wanted to clear that up a little bit. So let me talk about that. Is that okay, Chris? Would you like me to kind of tackle that a little again? Because I, I feel like I, I have a better kind of explanation of what's happening. So if we remember, neural networks are neurons and these connect by weights across those neurons. And these can be represented as matrices, right? So each of these weights and how they connect, if we have a three by three, we get a three by three matrix. So we could have 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.4, and so forth, and say 4.1, and then fill in this matrix with a various, various other numbers of weights in here. And what we'd like to be able to do is these are stored as 16 or 32-bit float. And so what we'd like to be able to do is instead of storing them as floats, we'd like to store them as ints. Or at least some 4-bit value. And so, forgive my handwriting, it's absolutely horrible today. Um, so what we'd like to be able to do is somehow quantize these, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to pick a block of those weights. So when we have a whole bunch of these numbers in here, we're going to take some subset of them typically, and we're going to pick those as the weights that we're going to quantize. So how we do the quantization is we're going to pick the highest value. So let's say this 4.1 is our highest value. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to bound the numbers here between some minima and maxima. And in the case of 8-bit, we tend to pick negative 127 to 127, and that's going to be our bound. So what we'll do with that is we'll find out what do I need to multiply 4.1 by to make it 127. So we take 4.1, and we divide it by, wait, am I going backwards? I might be going backwards here. Um, it's going to be 127 divided by 4.1 instead. Apologies. So 127 divided by 4.1, and that's going to give us our quantization factor. I just need to pull up a calculator and actually figure out what that value is. And that's going to be, oh, that's actually a pretty nice number. So it's going to be about 30.98. And so now we're just going to go through and multiply every other number in here. And this guy is now going to become 127. So 4.1 becomes 127. And if we wanted to say take the 1.1, we would take our 1.1, multiply it by 30.98. That would become, let me whip out a calculator again, 1.1 times 30.98. And that's going to become about 34. And that was, and that's what it would round to. So then we round when they're not exactly that value. 
And we do that for every number in that block and we carry this quantization factor around. So let me get rid of this mess here. Promise, I'm just a little shaky, I'm sorry. I get a little nervous, so I'll, I'll get unnervous as we go through. <clears throat> And so what we do now is we have this quantization factor. So we're going to have blocks or neighborhoods of these things. So we're going to have several blocks of these values. And let's say this is the matrix we just dequanted or quantized. So we're going to have that quantization factor and we're going to have one for every single neighborhood that we go through. And so when we want to do the, the dequantization process, we have a map back to the values that we what we quantized. And using something like the normal float, in the example I just gave, we are rounding. We don't want to actually do that. We use the normal float, but it makes it a little more complex. <clears throat> so what we want to do is as we're doing our back propagation, we're going to take every value in this matrix here, and we're going to multiply it times this quantization factor again, or divide it, whichever route we went. And we're going to, in this case, it will be divide, right? Because we want to go back. And that's going to be used in the back prop, right? Because you have to calculate derivatives. So the derivative, if we remember, is some rate of change, right? So if we have some velocity function and that velocity function is changing, the derivative is going to tell us what the acceleration at any given point is. And so to compute back prop, we have to be able to compute these derivatives. But when we're in integer form, like they would be here, we don't get derivatives. Here. Hyper snug. That does, does that make more uh, sense, Chris? I hope it does. I think that makes it a little more, more sensible. So the idea is you start with quant. Then when you want to tune, you go back through back quant, so you dequant it, and you use that to compute derivatives. So that's why that has to exist. Does that does that make more sense? So now let's see. I think Hypersniper had some questions. Um, Hypersniper asks, "Do you think we might be at a stage now where a developer just needs to code high level code without knowing all the intricacies of machine learning?" I think we're getting closer. So I think even right now, you you have a lot of people who just use the tools and I don't think they completely know like the, just the finest details of them, right? So if you have something like a CNN, so if this is a convolutional neural network, wow, that was really poorly written. Um, so if you have something like a convolutional neural network or a CNN, what you really have is you have an image, for example, and you run a kernel over it. And what a kernel is, is it's just an n by n um, window that you can slide over the image with, right? And if you have a portion of the image that you're looking at, you average those pixels and you can reduce the size of that image. And the reason it does that is it uses that technique to be able to tell something about what features are present in the image. And I think people just kind of naive, naively use these now because we have made the tool set broad enough that you don't need to understand all the hyper intricacies, right? And I think a, an analogous uh, use case to this is if we're driving a car, right? You don't really need to understand, oh, I'm accelerating at 6.1 meters per second squared you know, to be able to functionally track your velocity, right? I think as tools evolve, you don't need to understand all of the underlying intricacy because someone else did that. That foundation has been laid. And so what we want to do now is keep growing on the field and find higher and higher and higher level applications, just like programming, right? Um, we don't need to write machine code anymore to program. We can use Java, Python, Rust, these really higher level languages that give us the power that machine language would have given us, but in a much more human consumable way. And I, so I think, yeah, I think we're reaching a point where machine learning doesn't require the intricate knowledge that it used to. I think that it's not important either. 
Um, I think it helps for some people to know the really deep magics because if they need to debug something or uh, hammer out a problem, they can. But if you're just looking to do applications and you want to build something, I don't think you need it. Um, that's kind of my opinion. I, I don't think that not knowing is necessarily a bad thing as long as you know how to combine those tools together to do something powerful. <laughs> Priestess Lucy asks, right, like a week ago you asked for fine-tuning ideas and community posts. Yes, there is, Lucy. So um, unfortunately, Lucy, I don't know if you saw my video, it took two uh, Now I realize I work two full-time jobs. So I, I do my videos when I have time between work. And so it took God, 16 hours to get um, QLora in its current state to work correctly. So I've been running the results in the background. I should have something done hopefully this weekend, early next week with those results. Um, one of the most interesting ones, though, was someone had recommended taking the King James Version of the Bible and running it through because that's a huge representation of text and seeing what just like a raw text dump would do. And I think the results were kind of interesting. So I'm, I'm compiling some of those results and I'll let y'all know what those are next week. Um, Nacho CTA asks, hey, Amen, loving your content value last week. And it's helpful, I'm glad. I'm glad that helps, Nacho. Um, so what else, what other questions do y'all have? Um, One video that I think is going to be kind of interesting while I wait for questions is I'm going to go on a massive ramble about the hyena matrices. Have you all read anything about the hyena paper? And then I'm going to talk about uh, landmark attention to um, the hyena paper. Um, and actually today, too, uh, I wanted to go over how I look at a data set and how I start to kind of pick it apart and how I want to create like Q&A data sets. How do I want to create raw training sets? How do I want to create embeddings? I hope those will be helpful to people, um, but I, I get a lot of questions on those and kind of how I, I brainstorm them. Um, but the hyena paper has been interesting and it was a paper by Michael Poley. And the basic idea is if you can find a diagonalization of your matrix for attention, you can do, it was really good, wasn't it, Kit? You can kind of get this real big reduction in the compute time. So if an analogous way of looking at it is, do you know what, um, do y'all know what an eigenspace is or eigenvalue? So eigenvalues, if you have some A times X, this is going to equal the eigenvalue times some vector. And if you can find this eigenvector, this comp computation is much easier because these are both vectors and this is a matrix and a vector. So you all you have to do is do a vector vector and you get the same calculation as a matrix vector. And so you can really cheapen the computation time and so what I think the hyena paper implies is that maybe this is like some kind of Hilbert space. And there is a diagonalization of the attention matrix, which means that instead of having like n squared or nightmare fuel in cube computation, we would have n log n time instead. And that is huge. So instead of talking about like 8K context or like 32K context, we're talking about one million token contexts, just, just that easily. And the Hyena paper did talk about like, I think they did a hundred thousand K context was in a kit. Um, I'm pretty sure it was anyway. Um, Priestess, uh, Priestess Lucy says I should read more papers on this stuff. Oh, you know what? They hurt my head too. Um, it takes to do the Q Laura paper. It took, oh, I think I, I spent about six hours just rereading the paper until I realized why the inverse session was there. Um, and then it just clicked. And it, I thought it was incredibly brilliant why the inverse session was there. Just to do the the, the loss sensitivity, right? Um, pretty clever, pretty clever stuff. And Tim, Tim is just an incredibly clever, clever guy. He comes up with really clever ways of doing this. 
Uh, Chris says, what kind of personal ML projects are you currently working on? So right now I'm working on three personal projects. I have one for wasting scammers time. Um, I named that one Lucy. Um, Lucy's job is to answer the phone for scammers. And I get these calls all day. I'm sure you guys do too, but I get like 20 of them a day. So now I just forward them to Lucy. But right now I'm not happy with Lucy. My Texas speech for Lucy is not good enough. So I'd like to give her a better Texas speech. Um, another, another personal project that I'm working on is some home automation. So I have a bunch of cameras around the house and I would like to be able to detect me. So if I walk up to the door, it automatically unlocks my door. So I'm doing a computer vision thing for the house and then um, something to track if my dogs ever get out of the house. So what I want to do is the camera will detect that a dog has gotten out the door and then I can tell if they got out. Um, yeah, it's just like Lenny. Um, let's see here. Dustin asks, when training an LLM for use, say, 500 people in commercial contexts, what are the pros and cons of using local versus, say, GPT 3.5? I think there are a few things to talk about. Um, scale and cost. Um, 3.5 is honestly pretty damn cheap for what it does. But you have a few considerations that I think we have to worry about. And I think number one is privacy. So if there's any concerns about, you know, HIPAA, um, you're an attorney, right? You're doing legal cases. You have anything with personally identifying information, counseling, things like that. I think OpenAI to me is not the best choice. That's when you'd want to go kind of open source. Two, if you have enough volume, right? So the cost for OpenAI, especially for four, 3.5, maybe not as much, but four and 32K context for is dramatically more expensive. Um, I think that's where a lot of the open source models become a lot more viable, like Falcon. Falcon is very good at reasoning. Um, the 40 billion Falcon is really good. Um, there's a problem in GPTQ with it right now, but I have a patch getting PR'd into open auto GPTQ um, that should help fix that. Um, the problem was they were doing naive matrix calculations instead of doing Kubla's. Um, so the order was like in cubed. So that should make it better. Um, but the other consideration is um, data control, right? You have, I think you have a much more concrete control over your data pipeline when you go the open source route because you control the entire end-to-end -end pipeline and you don't get that in open AI. So I, I feel like those are kind of the considerations that I like to make when I'm choosing if, because I'm not opposed to open AI. I don't think there's anything wrong with using ChatGPT. I just think you have a lot more control over your data when you go open source. Um, VJ asked, does QLaura assume normal distribution for quantization? Is it correct to do that? Yes, it does. Yes, it does actually. So QLaura absolutely can, uh, assumes a normal distribution. So one of the steps that happens in uh, QLaura's version of quantization is that it assumes that all the weights are not only normally distributed, but they are zero centered normally distributed. So that's why in the paper, it talks about the four bit normal float. So if ooh, that's horribly written F, um, so that's why it talks about the normal float. So the normal float is an asymmetric uh, quantization. So it starts on negative 1.0, goes to positive 1.0, and then it goes, I think it's negative like 0.95 over here, 0.95, etc. But over here, it has a zero here instead of having another negative number and then you have your positive number so you have seven negative numbers you have eight positive numbers but you get the zero because remember when we're talking about quantiles and especially quantiles on zero distributed numbers that zero is very important so yes 
it is seen as it does see them as normally distributed specifically on negative one to one so it'll take the weights find the maximas and squeeze them into negative one to one i hope that helps um what other peft can be combined with culora uh not a lot right now because culora is still pretty young um but you can merge um so you can merge your culoras in so in the other uh implementation of the laura you could merge but now you can i'm sure you could but there wasn't tools um We'll ask for someone without a machine learning dev background, 24 years old teaching self, what foundational papers topic should I dive dive to more effectively follow your lessons? I'm a productive person who can code in Python. So I have no formal education in machine learning. I am totally self-taught over the last uh, several years. My background is in mechanical engineering, applied math, electrical engineering, computer engineering, and physics. And I got into machine learning just out of Quinky Dink. Um, I had a friend who really wanted me to join their company doing NLP. I didn't want to do it, but I joined it. And then I just self-taught. So one of the big papers that, one of the big things that actually helped me was a book. Let me get this book for you. Um, hold on one sec. Oh. Apologies, I'm just grabbing this for you. It was, there we go. This book I thought was pretty good. I think this is like the newer version of it, but I just, I read it again and I liked it. It was Mathematics for Machine Learning by Desenroth, Fossil, and Ong. I thought that was just a really good intro. Um, then once you're done with that, there's a couple of just really great YouTube tutorials actually just to shout out some people um let's see here design neural network from scratch i think is what it's called um he has a book too and it's a really great book but i recommend this to people i watched the whole thing and i thought it was brilliant here it is yeah it's by syntax um it's neural networks from scratch he does a great job of walking you through this step by step Totally brilliant. Um, and I think if you were to watch Syntex, here, let me drop this in the channel here. Because uh, I assume I went a little fast there. So let me drop this in here, his name, because uh, just a great channel. There we go. So yeah, I, I, re I highly recommend Syntax stuff. Uh, 10 out of 10. I absolutely adore him. Um, Chris says, Haha, like Lenny from 3PBX. Yeah, I know, right? Um, Kanab, is it true that ML engineering in the industry is more like software development than ML? I don't know. I think it depends on where you're working, honestly. I think that there is probably a bias towards people doing more software style than there is science, but... Um, I do a lot of the science still. Um, so it really just depends on where you're working. Um, I know a lot of people who do ML ops, I think is kind of the, the hot topic now, um, where you worry about, you know, the Docker containers and how we spin it up and down. But um, I work on a lot of the science, so actually creating these models. So my first real foray into computer vision was, you know, template matching and using template matching to do stitching. So we had, um, we would take circuits. So you'd have an integrated circuit and you'd get something like this. So let me, oh, uh, you take a scanning electron microscope and you would get images back like this where, oh, it's not wanting to open, sorry. Give me one sec. So you would get images kind of like this back where you would actually be seeing the circuits that represent the you know, hardware. And so what you'd want to do is reverse engineer those circuits. So you'd want to go back to the GDS2 and Verilog for that circuit, but you have a physical piece of equipment, right? The scanning electron microscope. So if you have some circuit here, and you're scanning regions of it, well, you have a physical instrument. So you get a little teeny delta error. So you have a little error. 
And so you have to create a stitching algorithm that will go through all of these tiles and align them correctly on their boundaries here and here and here. And when you're talking about some of these modern circuits, you get something like 1,500 by 1,500 images. So, I mean, you've got millions of images that you have to stitch, and you have to make that performant. And so eventually, I converted this from being a um, template matching algorithm to being a machine learning algorithm, and we could do an under an hour. We could get these to stitch usually. And with 99.3% accuracy, so we'd have to manually adjust some, but uh, the vast majority of them would, would stitch automatically, saving a lot of time. And then we had machine learning, like UNET models that would go through and pull the traces and vias out, and that was super cool. Um, let's see here, but no, I mean, it depends, kind of. A lot of people do the science, a lot of people do ML ops, a lot of people do kind of software development, it's just all over the board. Um, Don Aver says, are you going to do another video on ethics? Yes, I am. Um, so there's going to be a very big video on ethics. I think ethics is very important and what the considerations are and how it may impact society and the things we need to think about. Um, BJ asks, can we hard code tree of thought, uh, into the model? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, you could, you could hard code, I think, a tree of thought pipeline. But I, you know what? I'm not as keen on tree of thought. Not that I don't like it. I just haven't used it as much. Um, my field is not as involved in it. So this week I was going to put more time into actually coming up to more on the speed on tree of thought. Uh, so I will, VJ, tell you what, I actually think it's an interesting video. When I'm, do a whole, why, I'm going to do a whole video, I think, on tree of thought. I think it's an incredibly fascinating topic. I think it deserves a whole video. Priestess Lucy asks, is there an open source model out yet that can consistently maintain multiple independent roles within a session, or is that still something we're working on? Oh, are you talking about in like your individual session or across like multiple actors acting on it? Um, in your individual session, I don't think so. Um, I'm not aware of any that can do multi-personality, but I, I, I'm sure that will happen. Um, it doesn't make sense for them not to. Uh, Kit Clouds asks, did you see the MIT Simple Model? I have not. I have not. Um, would you send me a link for that? That's interesting. Um, BJ says, thanks. No worries. Hyper Sniper. Thanks. No, no worries, Hyper. Um, shout out to the self tots. It is very important, I think. Um, grokking Deep Learning. <laughs> Uh, VJ says, thanks for super good technical, but easy to consume tutorials. Oh, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad they're helpful. Um, for your comp viz health op, have you considered the potential of using an image to bypass? And are you, oh, I have not. I haven't actually thought about that. Um, so are you thinking like, oh, hold on, for comp viz health, have you considered the potential of using an image to bypass? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I think that there is a potential that someone could just use an image. Like, they could put the a picture of me up and maybe bypass. Um, I think that there may be ways to get around that. I think I could have it do a focus test, maybe. So, I think the image of the problem with a flat image is if you try to focus and defocus, that the focus field would not be consistent. And maybe that would work to prevent someone from just using a photo. Uh, but I'd have to think about that. I, I didn't think about that. That's a pretty good problem, actually. Um, I tried fine-tuning on raw text on King James Version Chunk and using a key S to end it and started talking like the King James Version. So it did work for me, but it would keep quoting the whole verse. Yeah, I think that there were some ways... There were some ways to get some slightly better behavior by not doing raw text. So that was part of what I found was if you try to teach it like the individual verses. So if you found a data set that breaks things down by where does the Bible talk about, say, X, and you teach it that way instead of just raw dumping it, I think I got a better result than not. Hagen said, is there any reason to keep using Laura? There's reason. Um, I think QLaura is a lot more powerful. Um, the problem with Laura right now is Laura, or sorry, QLaura is it's very experimental still. Um, the but 
the power of Culora is you just you can attach to more layers, right? So if you have some model um, where you're progressively feeding through the model, if you can have a LoRa attached to every one of these layers or more, and you know there's sub layers inside these layers, um, then you get a much more performant model. Um, I think compared to the other Laura where we were really only attaching things on just the individual layer. Um, but for right now, it's just not stable. So if you're doing anything in production, I would not use Q Laura yet. Um, Laura still does well, but Q Laura is just way more powerful. Caesar asks, what determines the size of context windows in the memory of LLMs? Mostly it comes down to what they're trained on these number of parameters, um, but mostly just design choices, right? I, I choose that I'm going to train this model to have a 2048 uh, token context window. And as far as I know, there really isn't truly a limit to the context size. That's why we can do things like uh, landmark attention. But... Um, if you haven't trained it to handle that kind of context, it's, it's just not going to do perform very well. Um, well says I'm making a tool that lets people fine tune diffusion models in two clicks via LoRa. Just 10 images produces interesting results. What sort of data is needed to produce interesting results in LLM? So as far as I know, the standard or the stable diffusion models are typically much smaller than the LLMs. I think, do they even have like a 10 billion standard uh, stable diffusion model yet? Um, I'm not as familiar with the stable diffusions, so I apologize if that's a very silly question. Um, but um, yes, definitely HyperSniper. More token is more memory. That is also a limiting factor for a lot of these guys. Um, so I think in QLaura, if you read the paper, an interesting number seems to be right at 10K. And that's, that's kind of what I found too, is right at 10,000, you start to see some pretty solid behavior out of your model. Um, I don't, unlike with Laura, where you were needing to, I, I couldn't get very good behavior with anything less than 100K. Personally, um, I had a lot of trouble getting there. But with 10K with QLaura, it seemed to be pretty performance. Um, I mean, a lot of mine were just like single layer LoRa's. So, I mean, I don't think I'm surprised that it took a lot. Um, it takes a lot uh, a lot more gradients to update a good LoRa than it does for multiple LoRa's. Um, so I think, I think 10K is kind of a magic number. Um, do you plan to merge too? Well, um, like you could do in Stable Diffusion, you can do them now with QLoras. There's tools now in the QLora library for uh, merging them, and I would highly recommend it. It makes them a lot more portable. I, I don't like the detach and attach thing. I want to merge, and I want to have different models for different use cases. VJ says, can we train QLora smaller models on mobile phone GPU? I don't know. I haven't tried it. I bet you could, though. Um, they're pretty small. The night... The, the memory usage from QLaura was tiny, especially the Alpaca QLaura. Um, I trained a 7 or 13 billion parameter model, and I was using, while training, while doing decent batch sizes, I was reaching 11 gigs of memory, <laughs> which compared to the previous LoRa, which was using all of my RAM, um, I thought that was a pretty interesting... Uh, decrease in, in resource usage. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't see why phones would be precluded. Um, I think you'd have to use a pretty small model, but some of these phones have incredible resources. Um, but I haven't done it personally. Um, uh, Kanav asks, what kind of project should one do to get started with ML? I know the theory, but I, whatever you think is interesting. Um, if you, there's, you can do a lot. I think an interesting problem to start with is doing some foundational stuff. So understanding what an embedding is. Um, so an embedding, right, is some space. So if we look at it as three dimensions, right? So if we put it on a sphere, um, anybody who's clustered together, right, and we can zoom in, say there, these are all going to be related things. 
So if we have words, this could be names, right? So it could be Jeff, it could be Alex, it could be James, etc. So names may be clustered here. And then over here, we could have cars. So we could have Toyota, we could have Honda and so forth. So maybe doing things like word uh, to Vec might be interesting. So word to Vec, um, a technique called TSNE, which is a clustering technique. So we can take very high dimensional data we can slam it down to three or two dimensions, and you can see how things cluster. I think it's interesting. Um, let's see here. Dustin asks, data preparation. What tools are available to automate preparation and what forms of preparation are best for certain tasks? That just depends on your data, unfortunately. There's just a billion different types of data sets. But what I like to do is I like to leverage if i have raw text i i like to try and leverage an llm right so i can take any old data set and i can chunk it at my llm and ask it to do stuff for me so let me just do an example let's go to let's grab an article off of wikipedia so let's ask for oh spectra graph and I can grab a spectrogram or the spectrograph information off this Wikipedia. And I can go to any old LLM. We'll just use ChatGPT for, uh, let's do, let's do a llama actually. So let's do llama. Does anybody have llama up and running? Oh, let's do Blanco. Blanco demo. And let's just ask it to summarize this. So I can drop this in here and I can ask it to summarize it. And there we go. So it can reshape the data for me. And I think LLMs are an interesting way to handle um, um, unstructured text. So let me see if I can ask it to do something a little more um, Powerful. Let's see. Can you turn this into a Q and a format? Let's see what it does with that. Ah, there we go. See, uh, Q. What is a spectrogram? A. A spectrogram is a visualization, etc. So you can even use the LLM to help you construct your Q and A data set. Um. I hope that helps, Dustin, but there's a ton of different ways, you know, scraping tools, H, you know, XML to JSON. Um, XML data tends to be just the easiest, right? XML or JSON data where you already have a structure to it, it just makes it easier to do what you're wanting to do. Um, Kit says the MIT model, MIT model, why did I say MIT? The MIT model has a fascinating self-learning model that doesn't rely on human-generated annotations. Oh, that's interesting. I will look that up after this kit. That is very interesting. Thank you for the thank you for the information on that. Uh, Sacred Grove says, if I'm making a wedding planner AI chatbot, can I use a cheaper free model to use it so it can be cheap and also give good performance? If it's only giving wedding type content, are you planning to make money on it? That's the ultimate question. Um, oh, that's an interesting one, Hyper. Um, can you, I feel like you could regex this though. Um, turn this into a Q and a JSON format. I have a feeling that'll bomb. I'd have to give it a better prompt. It worked! Check that out. That's pretty cool. All right. I didn't expect that to work. I thought that was going to bomb. Um, okay. Well. That, that worked, I guess. Um, sorry, that was kind of exciting that that actually worked. Um, if I'm making a... But yeah, if you plan to make money on it, Sacred, that's the differentiator. I would use something like Falcon, because that one's fine. Falcon, you can use all day, free. That's that's Apache open source. But Llama is out of the question. That's against the, the license, unfortunately. Um... Is it possible? Oh, sorry. Uh, Caesar asks, I see. I'm interested in using LLMs for world building, characterization, dialogue, and writing in general. It needs to be very large memory and context window. Otherwise, it's it starts forgetting. So you're going to want to check out landmark attention, Caesar. 
Um, landmark attention, and this is a very rough explanation of it, but if you have a long input text, so you have lots and lots of input tokens, so these are sentences, right? There's words in these sentences, and you just got a bunch of them. What it will do is, if you have a large context, it takes the attention layer, and if it's paying a lot of attention to this, it'll yank it out, and then it'll go to the next batch from your large input, and it will see where in here it's paying a lot of attention. Grab that, and use that as sort of like a summarization technique, and it has a much wider good context doing that. Um, than the previous iterations did. Someone did a, I don't remember what the landmark attention paper claimed, but it was actually quite a large context. Um, let's see here. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, let's see here. Is there, okay, so VJ asks, um, is it possible to get embeddings from an LLM? Yes. Um, you can get embeddings from your LLM, but there are, there are tools that are just designed for it. Um, Instructor Excel is a very powerful one. Um, E5 Large. Um, and you can find more here on the MTEB. So Massive Text Embeddings. Um, yeah, here we go. Massive Text Embedding Benchmark. And this has all of those. So here we go. Here's the leaderboard for it. And I'll drop that here for you guys. There you go. And these are really, really, really powerful embedding tools. Um, but yes, VJ, you could. You could in theory. Um, not in theory, in practice you could. Um, how to generate auto fine tuning data sets from PDFs using LLMs itself. Any examples? Um, I'd have to create like a pipeline where I'm taking the uh, text out of the PDF and feeding it into the LLM. Um, I don't, I'd have to program that up really quickly, but um, you could do that. Yes. Um, well, what does a 10K data set look like as you describe being sure? I have kind of an example right here. Uh, this is kind of an overkill, honestly. I found that this data set was probably just too big, to be honest. Um, let me go pull it up for you really quickly. Um, do, do, do. Where did I put it? There it is. Example data sets and output. Here we go. So this is kind of what they look like. So this is my favorite data set, kind of the med quad Q and A. And this is way more than I actually ended up using to train the model. I think this is about, oh. 30,000 samples, um, but they're not huge, right? So I have an instruction pretty consistently, you are a medical expert and you'll answer questions related to medical inquiries. Then the input is something about medical. Um, and then what are the symptoms of childhood, soft tissue sarcomas and some response about that. So I would typically chunk these up if they were really large and teach it different things about them. Um, so if we had, let's see if there's a particularly large one. Yeah, here's a particularly large one. So in the, this particular, what are the treatments for childhood soft tissue sarcomas? I would break it up and create multiple questions from those. Um, let's see here. Chris says private G GPT, um, data formatting thoughts. I don't have any actually. Um, I can do a little more research though, Chris, if you'd like me to. Um, Kanav asks, Amon, do you know if machine learning LLMs, et cetera, is being used or can be used in automated theorem proving? Oh, yes, that is. If you check out OpenAI, they have an open project for that right now for doing automatic proofing. Um, I know of, I have a friend of mine who worked in the field of automatic proofing and um, apparently a lot of what OpenAI is doing is very interesting. I am not super aware of the field myself, um, but I can try to find some papers and link them to you if you'd be interested. Um, Sacred Grove says, thanks, no worries. Um, Caesar says, thank you. Um, the claim, infinite context, but have only done... Yeah, the, the claim is infinite. It's dodgy. Um, I think 32. 
is probably pretty realistic, right? It, with landmark attention um, and with probably what MIT is doing too. I'm sh MIT is clever. They're clever people. Um, I'm, I tend to believe a lot of their research. Um, I don't take it at face value. I'm going to prove it for myself, but I, I tend to have a little faith there. Um, what do I think of lane chain? I think it's cool. I think agents are great. Um, I have not done a ton with them. Um, but I, one of my colleagues, Otto has done a lot with them, um, setting up systems at his work and he's liked what they do, especially if you combine it with something right. Combine it with embeddings, combine it with um, Llama Index, combine it with something else that you can help kind of guide the LLM with. It tends to be quite powerful. Um, I don't think so. You know, Vijay, I don't think so. I, I tend to think, so Vijay asked, but is an LLM embedding better than traditional? Well, I mean, this is a transformer embeddings, right? So these embeddings are transformers. Um, so E5 large instructor XL, as far as I'm aware, they're in their transformers. Um, let's see, this should be a transformer model. So we're not, so what VJ is getting at, and I think that, yes, so it is a transformer. So what VJ is getting at, and this is actually a really, really good point is when we typically talk about embeddings, we have a fixed Euclidean space. So if I have an embedding space and I have, and let's say these are tokens, right? So my tokens float around in space here, and this is the names again, right? Well, these are fixed in, in space, right? So James, for example, let's say it's on a three-dimensional vector, maybe at 12.1, 13.2, 14.5, and so forth, but these are fixed. Well, what the transformer can do is it can move us around, right? So thinking of embedding spaces in your transformers as being fixed Euclidean spaces is probably not as helpful as thinking of them as being able to move around in that space. Um, and I'll link you guys to an article that's great for this. But the ultimate product of a sentence embedding or a word embedding out of a transformer is a direction, right? So if your embedding space has all of this and you get a bunch of these tokens, so you get James is, you know, and then 14.2, 11.1, 12.3, and you get just a bunch of these tokens, you would end up with this vector if you kind of average them together, you did cosine, something, if you mutate them together. But what the transformer does is it uses attention to look at all of these and its final output is in a different direction than what it would have been. So that's the true power behind the transformer. And let me get you the article on that. This is, uh, this is super cool. Um, here we go. I, I really thought this was one of the best explanations of embeddings and transformers I have uh, ever read. And I, it just did a great job of, of breaking it down without, um, without being overly pedantic. And here's another really, really good one. So, uh, VJ asks, how do we embed graph and tabular data in LLM prompt? Again, kind of depends on your data, unfortunately. Um, if you want to embed it, um, you would just, I think you would have to embed both. I'm not sure. I, I, I'd have to see the data, VJ. I'm sorry. Um, if you want to send me a sample, I can take a look at it. Um, Sacred asks, I was trying to train ChatGPT on the Langchain and OpenAI docs so I can teach it. Emmy at the level I'm on. Oh, teach me at the level I'm on. How would be the best way to give it without copy and pasting every page? Um, if you want to, oh God, you're copy and pasting. Ouch. Um, you should be able to just upload a fine tune document to ChatGPT. Um, I think the API supports uploading batches. Um, let's see here, train, chat GPT, API. I'm pretty sure it does anyway. Um, do, 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 it should. Um, here we go. 
Yeah, you should be able to upload an entire file to whatever version that you plan to train. Um, oh, did I put train instead of fine tune? I did. There we go. So yeah, so you can prepare your data. So what you're going to want to do is you're just going to create a JSON format of write your prompt and your completion. And you can put as many samples as you want in there. You're going to upload it. And then you're just going to have it run that command, the command to train on that data set. And uh, I hope that helps. I, that's, that's pretty straightforward with ChatGPT, fortunately. Um, let's see here. HyperSniper asks, also one last question, evaluation. Can you explain your process? I can. So I do a lot of RLHF. Um, are y'all familiar with reinforcement learning through human feedback? So we, what we want to do is we want to drive, well, there's lots of ways, but since I do a lot of medical stuff and legal stuff, we tend to do RLH, RLHF, which is reinforcement learning through human feedback. So we just present what the LLM thinks is a good response. So it will give a response and then the human can say yes, no, something in between. And this drives a loss function. And based on what the human does or doesn't like, that's gonna push a loss function. Um, cool McDude says, I just joined. We briefly talked about embeddings on the bloke servers. Are you planning on making, yes, I am. I love embeddings quite a bit. So there will be a whole video on. Now there's already a video on him, what embeddings are. But I'm also going to do a video on creating those embeddings and using them in vector databases and other other kind of apps like that. Um, GPTF for theorem proving. Yeah, I'm going to check that out, BJ. That's pretty cool. A day in the life of ML expert. Um, you know, it's just mostly reading papers, honestly. So if we go through like my browsing history, it's actually pretty boring. It's just like a billion papers. Um, the one I have open right now is this one. Um, let me see if I can, oh, that's not the paper. Um, one second. This is a paper on pruning machine learning models. So there it is. Um, it's this paper, a pruning by example, a novel criterion for deep neural network pruning. Um, it's one of the more foundational papers in the process of pruning. So what you can do is if you have zero distributed weights and they're around zero here, right? A lot of these weights here are kind of useless, honestly. So if you've got weights that are like 0 0.000001, they're not adding a lot to the output. So you can just chop them. And so some claims can be made that up to half of a network can be pruned. Um, I'm suspicious of those claims, but um, I'd like to learn more about the printing process. Um, BJ asks, for embeddings, oh, sorry, I think I skipped someone. Uh, the challenge, oh yeah, the challenge is metric distance. Yeah, the, the, the challenge is, right, where does that vector point? Uh, Sacred says, the awesome, thanks, no worries. Um, BJ says, for embeddings, uh, the Vic Greg and... Info NCF papers from Meta explain challenges embed and embeddings training. I haven't read those papers actually. Could you link those to me, VJ? Um, Hagen says I have a data set of 1,000 sentences. These are scored on how humorous or funny people think they are. How would I go about fine tuning an LLM to translate a less funny sense? Oh, that's interesting. Hagen, that's cool. I don't know off the top of my head. Is it okay if I take a little time to think about that, Hagen? Let me actually, I'm going to keep a running tally really quick of things that I promised to look at. Um, humor versus, that's a really good use case. I feel like you'd want to A-B it, right? So you'd want to teach the network something like, this is unfunny, but here's the funny version of it. And you could kind of train it to complete off of that, I don't know. I'd have to. I'd have to think about that. So, um, funny versus unfunny, fine tune. That's a. That's an interesting use case. I hadn't thought about that at all. Um, one thing that I did, Hagen, was similar to this. Actually, let me kind of go on a little tangent here. So, 
we had a use case, and I talked about this in another live stream, but we had a use case where we had pump it into the LLM or into a process really. And this process would go into our embedding space, right? Pull out similar documents to this person's ailments, give that as context to the LLM alongside the rejection, and then it would pop out an audit. Or not an audit, I'm sorry, an appeal. I don't know why I said audit. Uh, but it would pop out an appeal. And that worked pretty well. And what we found is that these models are really good at learning how to be a something. Like, it's good at being an appeal writer. It's good at being... Oh, did I, did I disconnect? It says I'm live. Did I disconnect? Oh, I can go back. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, we are, we have Comcast working all day over there, and um, it's been it's been fun. Um, so let me start over. I, I apologize for that, guys. Um, so we start with the appeals process, right? And I'll, I'll explain it a little better this time. So the appeals process is is I have a bill that I would like to be reimbursed for, right? So I have some bill. I submit it off to an insurance company. This could be Medicare, Medicaid, something like that. They come back with either one of two things. They come back with a yes or a no. More times than not, it's a no. So if it's a no, we want to file an appeal. So I need to switch to AT&T. Xfinity is terrible. Um, so more times than not, it comes back and out. So what we did was we took an LLM and we taught it how to write appeals. We just gave it a bajillion examples of how to write these appeals. And what we found is it's really good at learning to write them, but we want to give it context, right? I don't want to try and teach it how to write every single appeal under the face of the planet. It's not, it's going to hallucinate too much and that's too risky. So we combine that with an embedding where this embedding space is just made up of a bunch of medical documents, right? And information about particular ailments. So if we get a no, then we can grab information about this patient out of the embedding space and we can feed in the rejection itself and we give that to the LLM and it writes us an appeal. And that worked really well. Maybe that something like that would work here. Um, yeah, I feel like maybe that would help. Um, I think maybe that's a place to start, Hagen. Um, I'll think about that a little more deeply. Uh, but I feel like that might be a good place to start. So, um, Apparently the stream died for a second. That was super fun. Um, is RLHF, so VJ asks, is RLHF better or anthropic, LL, anthropic LLM based rating better? I don't know. I don't really have a super strong opinion there, VJ. Um, I I kind of just prefer RLH, RLHF because I want that human feedback for really sensitive stuff. I want to have the subject matter expert give me feedback, but that's not always possible. It costs money to have shmees, you know, subject matter experts come in and give feedback. Sometimes you don't have that. You don't have the money for that and that's okay. So you have to find another technique. Um, seemed up, let's see, YouTube's machine learning AI felt exposed. So yeah, we had to stop. Yeah, it's, it was embarrassing. Um, Let's see here. That humor fine tuning sounds good indeed. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, let's come down here. Personal question. Do you like reading papers during the day, early evening, or late night? I am a night owl. I'm way more productive at night than I am during the day. So if I am going to do something, it is definitely going to be at night. Um, let's see here. My wife works for one of the major insurance companies and she does appeals and they have been outsourcing many nurses in the field. I told her, get ready. It's just being, it really is. It really is. 
Um, now, and it's unfortunate. Nurses are incredibly important to our society. Just to go on a ramble, nurses bring a ton of value. They are underappreciated. My dad was a medical, was an MD. My mom was an MD. My uh, daughter's mother is a nurse. They're so they're important. Medical professionals are incredibly important. Hagen says, thank you for your suggestion. Interesting case. No worries, Hagen. I will give some further thought on that. All right, guys, I'm going to take a five. I'm going to take a five minute break. So we'll come back at 705 if that's OK with everybody. And um, we'll be right back.
So what I think is a really cool, oh, I left my pen. I'm sorry. I'll be right back. I wanted to introduce you guys to my corgi. Oh. This is my corgi. This is Mr. Poe. This is who the channel image is based on. This is Poe. He's very sweet. He's just been sitting here the whole time. He usually just sits at my feet while we do this. <laughs> so, what this is on now is landmark attention, I think is one thing that I think would be interesting to talk about. So, one of the biggest concepts in machine learning or in, in attention is how can we broaden context? <clears throat> Any good ideas for student projects on generative AI? Yes, VJ. And actually, I think this will lead into that. So let's talk about what attention is so we can understand how to broaden it. <clears throat> so attention is made up of query, key, and value. So what is the query, what is the key, and what is the value? So the query is basically what are you asking it to complete, right? So this is your question or your input. The key is metadata. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm having bad asthma. Um, and the value is the actual outputs themselves. So in this case, it's the actual tokens. So what you can do is you can combine this query, this key, and this value to help the model be able to make determinations. So one way that I like to think of this is looking at it as how I determine things, right? I've given this example before, but how do I determine that this what this is? Well, I ask the question, what is this? And then I look at some details about this thing, right? It's, it has oblate sides, it pops open and closed, it has headphones in it, it's AirPods. But it, it could possibly be a waffle, but it's not a waffle. It's, it's AirPods. That's how I know by paying attention to those features. So we can take advantage of this and get some broader context out of it by using landmark attention. So what landmark attention does is if we have some really, really like big splattering of text, let me go grab something really quickly so I'm not just scribbling. Um, I'm just gonna grab something on medicine. So let's grab the Wikipedia article on this. And I just have a huge amount of context, right? So something that the model would normally not be able to handle. And, all right, I'm going to increase the font on this too, so we can all see. So, what I could do with landmark attention is as I'm pumping this through, right, so as we get this query key and value, and this goes into our attention layer, we can look at how each portion of these inputs are being paid attention to by this layer, basically. And I can make the determination, oh, it's paying a lot of attention to those and those, and it's paying a ton of attention to this, and it's paying a bunch of, oops, it's paying a bunch of attention to this, then we can use those as inputs for the final input into attention and that can help us be able to get broader context because as humans, we don't pay attention to all of the things we're being told. We pay attention to some small portion of what we're being told. 
And so this results in us um, being able to have much, 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 much wider context than we normally would, because now we can summarize and have the model self-summarize, basically. Um, and uh, this is a kind of trivial explanation. I'm, I'm going to give a much, much, much more detailed video on what self-summarization is and, and how these models work. But um, I think an interesting student thing, BJ, would be... And you want it to be multimodal, right? So you want to take images. You want to do something with those images. You want to take text. Oh, have you ever seen Planetars or Pal Palantars demo for their military use case? Those are kind of cool. So what I think might be interesting is something that you could do today is let's say you have a bunch of GIS data. So you have a bunch of GPS data, right? So you have a bunch of tiles and you want to automatically have an LLM help you determine which of these are really cloudy? So what has bad cloud coverage in it, for example? So what I think might be interesting is you could embed some of these, right? You could embed them with like a segment anything now model. So you could use Sam from Meta. Um, eh. Got myself kind of cramped. There we go. So we could use Sam, their segment anything model. And then you could extract the segmented items. So you could grab clouds or something in this case. And feed that into some vector DB or something. And then have the LLM be able to search this. And summarize, oh, you know, tile 468 has a bunch of uh, clouds. Tile... 581 has a bunch of clouds, stuff like that. I think that might be kind of cool. Uh, and I think that actually would have some real world applications too, because how these get disseminated is by date, right? And sometimes these images are just crap. Um, you get a lot of cloud coverage. You get a lot of, uh, you get a lot of useless tiles. So I, th I think that might be a kind of interesting project to do. Um, and I feel like you could just do it. Um, let's see if segment anything now can do, um, clouds. It should be able to. Yeah, it looks like it can. Um, if you haven't seen it, let's go to segment anything model meta. Um, yep, here it is. And I think this is where you can actually get the model. I'm not sure. I'll have to, I'll, I'll find where you can get it to, but I'm pretty sure this is where you can get it from. Um, and you can just use it as a segmentation model and does a bunch of cool stuff. Sacred Grove, a code interpreter. Um, there are several good models for doing code. Um, there's Star Coder, I think is the really powerful one. Um, yeah, here it is. Um, Star Coder, it's the state of the art LLM for code. This seems to be the one that uh, I have heard a lot of good things about. Um, so I would try this one out if you're looking for an LLM for code, Star Coder. Um, let's see if Star Coder has an embedding to. I'm pretty sure it does. Creating a coding assistance with, let's see here, embeddings. Yeah, so it looks like you can also capture your embeddings out of Star Coder. With ephemeris data. What do you mean by ephemeris, Andrew? I'm sorry. Um, ephemeris. I just be a word I'm not I don't know. Ephemeris. Ephemeris using celestial navigation and astronomy. I don't know. Um, I don't know if I can detect stars and whatnot. I don't know if I can detect stars and whatnot. Um, that would be interesting. Let's find out. Um Segment anything model stars. Um, feature by the star in the firmament. I don't know. I would just try it out. Honestly, I'm not really sure. VJ asks, one of the big challenges with agent model is to express agent spec. The gorilla paper tries to one way to fill in. 
The ranking problem of mapping payload to tool is a big challenge. I don't know, BJ. I really don't. Um, that is way past where I go with agents. Um, but I would be happy to do some reading on it. Um, let me add that. That's a that's an interesting question. Let's see here too. Um, I'm actually just going to copy and paste that question in here. That is a very interesting question. Um, the gorilla paper. Let me pull it up. Let's we'll see if I can get a quick sense for what this is. Um, let's see here. Agents, LLM. Let's see here. Gorilla, large language, massive APIs. Oh, interesting. So implement generative agent. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, one sec. Let me actually pull this up for everyone. Um, okay, so this is the GitHub for it. Okay, so if we take a look at how to find change star coder from my repository. Oh, that's an interesting one, BJ. Um, they actually do have some examples, I think. Um, let's see here, fine tune star coder. Uh, here we go. So it looks like they have some examples here on doing it with like Stack Exchange. Um, I haven't personally fine tuned star coder, so I don't know what their data sets typically look like, but it looks like they have some nice samples here um, for doing some fine tuning. Um, if you have any trouble with it, let me know. Leave a comment after the after this, and I'll see if I can do some digging and help. Um, Joseph Seth's gorilla would be interesting to investigate. Is gorilla glue? I like that. I like that. Um, so it looks like what the point of this is. So it ties a whole bunch of. Yes, we're actively working on it. This is interesting. So. Is Gorilla's main point then is the idea that it helps the um, LLM to be able to know which models to use to do a task? Is that the basic idea, right? And to try to reduce, like, yeah, there it is, reduce hallucinations, etc. Oh, that's interesting. So let's try to try to keep it a little more on track. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah, this is interesting. I will do. I will also do a video on this. Actually, this is pretty cool. Yeah, that's added. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just not as I'm not as deeply involved in the agent stuff. I think as others. Um, I tend to be more in the um, semantic search, automation of processes. I don't tend to be more in the agents, um, but I need to get more involved in them. I really do. Um, I should I should I should get more familiar with them because Langchain and all those are very powerful tools. And I just need to be more familiar with them. Um, but that was really all I had to go over today, guys. I just wanted to kind of get us up to speed on where we were with landmark attention. Um, answer the questions that I couldn't quite get to yesterday. Um, did y'all have any other questions? Um, I don't want to hold y'all here for two hours. Hold y'all hostage for no reason. So um, give y'all a few minutes to give you a couple minutes to throw stuff out there, but I think that was a, about all I had to go over today. I guess I could ramble, actually. I could ramble about something really quickly. One thing that I thought was kind of cool, um, I had done some reading into um, people who were doing, um, using LLMs and machine learning for the automation of creating treatments. Oh, actually here, Andrew says, think, are you going to do a tutorial where Laura should? Yes, I am. Um, Andrew, I am definitely going to do a tutorial on that. So Andrew asked, thank you. Are you going to do a tutorial with Laura showing your process? And the answer is very much yes. Um, I'm going to do a whole tutorial on walking through how I collect my data set, how I process my data sets, the various tools that I like to use. So I have a few things that I like to do, specifically if I have papers. So there's an interesting problem with PII. So personally identifying information, how do you find that? So let's say you have something where you have HIPAA guiding you. And if your paper or your LLM spits out raw training data, 
you have a huge problem. So how do we determine PII's presence? And the answer is a few different tools. So you can use a NAIR, so you can use named entity recognition. You can use an LLM. This gets expensive though. This is many dollars, all of the dollars. This one is like a dollar. So NAIR is a good place to start um, because you don't want to start with the most expensive thing, right? You want to try and refine as much as you can without going to like the drop dead expensive route. Um, so if you can use an air, you should. Um, there's other things you can do. You can use part of speech analysis even. So if you have some kind of regular, regular form to your data, um, you can also use regex even. So let's say you have social security numbers, right? You could have one, two, three, dash, four, five, dash six, seven, eight, nine. And you can have a regex that can try and weed out social security numbers because you really don't want that in your training set. That would be a sad. Um, so I will go through like this whole process that I do. There's dozens of tools that I throw at this for trying to weed out bad information, um, trying to weed out you know, PII, trying to weed out different things that we really just don't want in our training set. Um, VJ, uh, VJ asks, any tutorial on synthetic data gen for problem domain will be great. Alpaca does broad domain exploring when I was specifically, yeah, I, I can give a tutorial on how I kind of choose those. And yeah, when I go over this, I'll also kind of go over how I choose a model. Um, I mean, right now it's kind of easy. There's not a whole lot of uh, friendly business models, Falcon, Starcoder, etc. cetera. Um, Andrew asks, is it possible to have LLMs make API calls to databases? Absolutely. Yeah, check out Langchain. Langchain can do all kinds of powerful stuff. You can have it make calls to Google. You can have it make calls to um, other API. There's lots and lots of power in agents. So that is that is kind of the point of agents in some sense is to be able to autonomously do something, right? So it can search the web, it can call an API, it can hit a database, etc. So yeah, tons and tons of things that you can do. So what you what you could do is you can tell your model in your prompt or however you're constructing it to say, hey, if you want to search, use this keyword. And I know it's Ugh, yeah, it's not. Yeah, I'm sorry, Andrew. It's it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, you know, you know what? I need to learn more about it too. And a good way to learn is to teach others. So I will I will put a video together on that. I am going to do a video on agents. So the gorilla video will include all the agents and the lang chain and all of it. And hopefully that will help. And I will just, I will just do the, the video of me suffering, learning it. It's, it's time to do it. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, the, I don't know how to handle the multi endpoint problem. Um, I think that that is handled though in one of Microsoft's papers with hugging face. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to mislead you guys. So I don't know how to do it yet, but I will learn. So, um, but this process I'm very familiar with this process of refining our documents, getting our data set to look good for training. I've done this for years. So putting together a video on this will be pretty easy. Um, but the agents one, I need to learn it myself. So I'll put a video together for you guys on that. Um, but what's interesting here is the way that you tackle the data that you want to remove really just depends on the problem you have. Um, there's a really cool tool that I like to use, and it can break things out into these kind of cool, oh, regex parsing uh, documents, oh gosh, what was it called? It can do, what you can do is you can define different document types. I, 
I did Raphael, and um, that is also going to be something that I'm going. It's not that one's not going to be a video. That one's going to be. Um, I want to do a live stream on like the history of AI, and go. Th I don't know if you guys would enjoy this, but I want to do a video on the history of AI or well, a live stream of it actually, where we go from way back in the day with expert systems. So systems like mycin for doing bacterial infections and go all the way to today and talk about what that progression has been. So context-free grammars, um, rules engines, um, uh, natural language understanding, natural or uh, named entity recognition, part of speech analysis, all the way to today and all the various branches and how it's gone. I thought that would make a cool kind of talk. And then everybody can ask questions. And if y'all would enjoy that, let me know. Um, I'd be happy to do that. I think it would be a cool video or at least a cool live stream. Uh, but I don't want to, I, I like to give y'all the more technical stuff as my long form content and something like that. I just feel like makes a better live stream so I can just kind of stream of consciousness it. Um, yeah, Code Refactor. Um, Star Coder, I think, does some pretty cool stuff with that. Um, training is important. I'm more than interested. Thank you again. No worries, guys. Um, but I think that's it. Um, I really appreciate everyone coming today. Um, and I just wanted to thank you guys. You guys have been wonderful in your support for this channel and the content that I create. Um, it has really been um, incredible to have such a great audience so quickly. I started this channel seven weeks ago, and we're almost at 1.5 thousand subscribers. And that is just phenomenal to me. So I just wanted to thank you all for the support and making this something that I really love doing. And I just wanted to say thank you guys. So, um, so I think that's it for today. I think... And they think that's good. So thank you so much, guys. I'll see y'all next time.